My father was a butcher and his brother Tony was a butcher and my uncle Joe was a butcher. They all trained in the northwest up in Derry. And at 17, I had to make a decision about uh, what to do. And I decided that rather than taking up an apprenticeship as a butcher, I would go to university and study to be a behavioral psychologist. And some of you might think, there's a clear difference between a behavioral psychologist and a retail crap butcher. I, I don't think so. What do you think? There's a lot of psychology, and I watch it. And I'm proud to say that everything I learned about what I did since, I mainly learned hanging on to my father's apron. He's a quiet man, um, but he's very, very effective because he's a fantastic listener. And as a retail butcher, he was a great listener, and a great watcher of people. But as a man, he's quite quiet. Um, so after I trained as a behavioral psychologist, I then went to work in the meat trade, selling wholesale to the retail butchery sector, to processors, to retail independent butchers, and to the retail multiples, both primals, vacuum packed, and further processed products that we had developed working with a number of firms down through the years. And I won't bore you with all of those, but what it did for me, maybe as a combination of sitting and watching my father, incidentally, if you can see, that's my father there in 1961, outside of James Doherty's in Derry, near the bog side. He's about six foot three, so as you can see, I have inherited neither his height, but I've got my, all my girth. That over there is my Uncle Joe, my Uncle Tony, God rest him, and several other relatives and uncles, all of whom worked in the business. <coughs> And I would have worked with my father in his shops down through the years, and I like to think, learned a lot about how he goes about his business. But if I was saying one thing, um, I overheard someone saying this recently. And I'm just going to tell you my story, folks, by the way. There isn't necessarily a meaning to it. It's just my experiences, and I hope maybe you find it useful. But for me, most of it's about two things, people and processes. Um, I think I got it from my father that very, very disciplined, almost militaristically disciplined about how he ran the shop and when we had to be set up and what stock was ordered and how it was prepped and how it was cut, who was on the road, who was on late, what mix of people worked well, who didn't work well together. And he was a disciplinarian. He stood at the door and he'd watch you coming in. And if you know what I mean, if he didn't like the look of you, he didn't work that day. And he also had to look at how you dressed if you weren't right to back out again. Uh, you had to stand your hands behind your back. And you had to lean forward and never touch the counter. And if he saw you facing in the way, because he said there's nobody in there with any money, all the people with the money come in through that door. So from that point of view, he, way back then, and you can see how, if you look at the design of that shop, Doherty's was very much innovative, but very traditional. They were very much about people, but they were also about innovation, even back in the 60s. Because again, there was a retail march back there. And that's why I would put to you an optimistic note to say it is possible because we've all had challenges down through the time and from 1961 onward. But I love this phrase when you think about it. And I always invite people when I'm working with them and when I'm coaching people, they say, well, I overheard someone saying this. And they said, look, it's real simple. Someone said, what's your strategy? And this was a small independent business. And they said, well, it's actually really simple. What we do is the customer's experience is so exceptional that they come back again and again. They tell other people who come back again and again. And somebody said, but what's your strategy? And he said, that is our strategy. It's just to be exceptional. We have to be exceptional. It's the purple cow thing that you talk about, John. And that's why I was delighted whenever John asked me to join you this evening to talk about my story, because I've got that strange mix of background that I am steeped in the butchery sector, and I was reared in it, and I worked in the shops from I was nine, and I learned an awful lot about language and about communication and about how people speak from listening to my father and the way he would engage with people and the way he would trade with them. And some people would say to me, you can't learn that. Well, you can't. Ah, you're either born with that. I go, no, you can learn that. You can be trained and you can be fast track trained. It's so critically important that I think the language is something I'd be very passionate about. This is a great proposition, isn't it? This is a great proposition to say, is our business the type of business where customer's experience is so exceptional, so exceptional, 
that they come back again and again. So there's two key elements. We retain our customers and we they get repeat business from them and they generate referrals. The three magic R's essential <coughs> retention, repeat business, and referral. They tell other people. And I'm going to tell you a quick story. I was going to keep it to the end, but I'll tell you now. Um, I went into my butcher's Michael McAllister the other week and he said, Alan, friend of yours? And I said, yeah. And I said, he would tell me he got gammon from you. And he said, he did, thanks very much. He got duck as well there. And I said, very good, that's another one for you. And he said, I appreciate that. And I said, not at all, I wouldn't send them if I didn't think you were any good. And he said, well, that's good to know. It's just a simple referral. But Alan lives on the other side of town. He's not in the catchment area of that butcher's at all. It has to be for him a destination. Why did he go there? He passed three or four other good butchers on the way through. But he passed through and he got to that one because of the referral process, because there was an act of referral. There was an act of referral process where he said to me, God, I'm scared of gammon. I said, what are you scared of gammon? He said, well, it's okay for you. And that's another point. I'll come back to that. I said, are you scared of gammon? He said, I'm just scared of prepping it. And he said, go to Murphy's and ask Jackie, and Jackie will tell you about gammon. He knows everything about pork. And he said, I will. And he did. And he's a customer. Some people say, does that happen by accident? And I think, not at all. It's about language, it's about the referral process, and it's about this, I think, at the very centre. But that's all very well, Michael. And, and as a psychologist, what would you say? I would say there's five key areas of focus. The culture, what do I mean by this? I'm going to ask you folks, because you've all been very quiet. I'm sure you're all normally this quiet, yeah? Yeah, for sure. I've heard about some of you at the Golden Drill in the 80s. What do you think, from looking at that photograph, the culture of that craft butchers is? What do you think? Shout out, whatever, just whatever word comes into your head. What would you say? Busy, history. Busy? Tradition? Yeah. Anything else? You can have to wait, but... Eh? And that's the full road in it. That's the full road in it. And they were processing as well, remember. Innovative with self-service in the 60s. Self-service in the 60s. Pre-rack, pre-pack. Yeah. One of the first rotisseries as well, Moy Park Chicken, put it in the door and attracted a lot of traffic, a lot of through traffic, and then started carving in store for eating there and then. Started with the staff. James started watching the staff and he said, look, this is what people do. The rotisserie worked very well. Anything else about them? Just as people, what would you say? They're all men. All men? Happy looking. Happy. Sorry? Happy looking. Happy looking? In what way? Just seem very... Yeah. Do you ever go to a pub and everybody's in a bad mood and you thought, this looks really great, Mum will stay here? No. This is what we're getting to folks. And I think that is so critically important. Do you know what these people refer to each other as? Brother. And to this day, if I go to meet my father for a drink on a Friday, which I sometimes do, but not often enough, I'm ashamed to say, if any of the men in this photograph come in, my father, you know how he addresses them? No, oh, brother. That's how he addresses them. Real affection. Because they were happy. And they looked happy, yeah? That's about the only time I've seen him smile. And I think that's very important when it comes to culture. If the culture of a business is what type of culture do you promote? Do you promote your staff to be happy? Do you promote your staff to be positive? Because it has a huge effect. Because people can see and hear that intuitively, can't they? Any people here who have got children away from home, or has anybody ever run home and you've said to your parent, how are you doing? What do they say to you? What's wrong? What's wrong with you? <laughs> They can tell 3,000 miles away down the phone that there's something up. That's what people do. People know that. And if people know that the people that they go to see are happy, they come back. If they go somewhere and they think people aren't necessarily that happy, they don't come back. Now, you might say, ah, but that's a gross generalization, Mike. Of course it is. But the culture of a business, I think, is strangely important. The strategy. Uh, and I don't mean some big fancy schmancy strategy, I just mean what do you want to be when you grow up? Strategy refers to what do we want to be? What type of product do we want to sell? What type of people 
do we want to have working for us? How do we want to develop our staff? What's our strategy for staff turnaround? We want to keep people all their lives. I said to a colleague the other day, or a business I'm involved in, I said, look, I'm hoping that I'm here for another 15, 20 years, and I hope you work here till you retire. And he said, are you joking? Now, this person's 29. They said, are you joking? And I said, no, I mean it. I hope you stay here for the rest of your career. And they said, well, that's up to you, Michael. And I thought, you know what? They're absolutely right. They're absolutely right. So I think, what is your strategy for product? Are you going to go serve over? Are you going to be price sensitive? Are you going to take on the others on price? Are you going to completely differentiate your offering? Are you going to be known for specialist? Are you going to be known for doing all year round? What is your strategy? What is your product plan? How do you plan to get in touch with your customers? Because the reality now is that everyone who's in business and who has an interest in communicating to people has to have a social media presence. We're all publishers. We, we, this is what we have to do. But we can control how to do that. <coughs> I, I'm a big fan of process because when I trained as a behavioral psychologist, I have to confess <coughs> I also trained in statistics. So I have a great in, in, in how things work together. But I know now where it came from because as a child on a Saturday night, my father would be investigating what the laundry was for the following week. He'd be looking at the rota for the following week. He'd have his order placed. He inspected every lamb that came in. He rejected about three quarters of it, um, which left us short, but he didn't mind because he said, I'd rather do without than too much. Um, so from that point of view, I think having a business that's heavily process driven is critically important. But I'd like to make a suggestion to you. Service is a process. And service is a process which can be learned. Service is a process which can be coached. And service is something that I think is critically important. And I'll give you an example. I was in a large retail coffee outlet this morning at 7 o'clock. And the first person came up and I said, a big coffee with some rim in the top and four bits of ice to cool it down. And he went like this, really? No room for milk? And I said, okay. I said, are you the only one on duty? And he said, yeah. And I said, because either you're going to have to wash your hands and make my coffee or get somebody else to make your coffee. And this person walked past. And do you know what the person did when they walked past? Morning. And I thought, right, well, there has to be a process for that. There has to be a process that says, under no circumstances, while serving a customer, may you put your hand to your face. Just don't do it because it has implications. And from a process point of view, can you coach people to do that? You certainly can. You have to then enforce it and implement it. And that's where one of the difficulties is. But I do believe service can be a process-driven science coupled with the art of <coughs> communication. And I think communication is critical. Um, when I worked in sales and was dealing with national accounts and talking to buyers, etc., many of the habits that I had acquired as a child, as a 9 and 10 and 12 year old working with my father, I used while talking to national buyers. I used it when I was upselling. And I see it, and I see it all the time. Um, I went to uh, Butchers recently and I thought, I know what I'll do. I said, I'll, 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 get, some, I'll get some sausages. So I ordered a pound and I got a pound of beef, a pound of beef sausages. Um, yeah, great. And I said, look, that's super. And he said, um, here, what's the story with you and the fillets on a Friday morning? Because I would have a habit of calling in a quarter date for fillets. And I said, well, it's because I go to work and you're closed at 7 and I don't get home to 7 on a Friday. And he said, you don't take a half day Friday. I said, no, but you just close at 6. He says, correct. I said, so I wouldn't want to go past you. And he said, I have the solution. Let me cut you out a full fillet loin. I'll take the tail off and I'll get you the steaks you like. I'll vacuum pack them and you come in and collect the full fillet and I'll give you a fillet for free. Freeze it down, take them out the night before. And I said, why would you do that for me? He says, because I'm sure I'm a shit the odd Friday and you go elsewhere, but you don't tell me. And he's right, because I might go to one of the many retail multiples on my way home. By and large, customer satisfaction determines the order value, and it determines whether those people come back again, and it determines whether those people tell other people, you should try Butcher X. So it's the three R's. Retention, repeat business, 
and referral. And the other thing that's often not, not talked about is loyalty, and it's a much abused phrase because I hear people using the phrase about loyalty. I'm talking about loyalty whereby, for example, I've been broadly loyal to the same butcher for about 20 years. Now that's, that's a substantial amount of loyalty. So, those are the five key elements of what I think is a profit service chain. What does our shop look like? Not from our point of view. Forget about ourselves for just a second because I'm looking at everything from the customer's point of view. And I say that as someone with admiration and affinity and affection for the sector. But we have to look at it and say, what is the quality of our shop design? What about the job design for the people who work here? Do the people that work here have a clear job description? Do we know what they're doing? Do we know what their tasks are? When we recruit people, do we go through a thorough process? And if we bring people on, do we let them know how we're going to develop them? Can we plan their life for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? How do we keep them? What rewards do we give our internal people? How do we reward them for work well done? Do we give them toil? Do we give them time off and loo for working on sociable hours? A quick example, a friend of mine who owns a number of butchery outlets was struggling with an idea of what to do because he thought he was losing trade. And I said to him, I think a lot of your trade at the upper end of what you have, you're missing them in the evening. So we trialled the system whereby one or two of the staff, depending on the day, would work extra. And I don't know if any of you operate that, but they operated a rota whereby they stayed open until 7, 7, 15. Some cases it worked, some days it didn't work. Strangely enough, Wednesday and Thursday, end of the midweek turn, they would get it. And it was washing its own face, generating new business, bringing in new customers. But because they had to think of the profits of the business, what they did was they sat down with the staff and they agreed a toil system. So they gave time off in lieu on some of the quieter days. Some people wanted paid overtime, but they agreed as a team that they couldn't afford to do it because they had to experiment it. And it slowly worked. It was really tough, really hard. And there were some times that they thought, this isn't working. Somebody else I was talking to and they were saying in the longer evenings, they stay open and what they do is they just cook out and they cook up and they invite people in. Uh, another butcher I know in Belfast was telling me that he does bowling classes whereby he'll bring down a lamb and he'll take a lamb down and show people how they do it. And he said it's starting to create small amounts of interest. But the rewards here, sorry, relate specifically to the staff. The other area as well I think is terribly important, but I would say this because I make part of my living out of this. But believe me, from I'm hanging on to my dad's apron from I was eight right through to now. I think the coaching of service skills is critically important. Just in the same way that we give people technical skills and butchering skills and HACCP skills, I do believe that service and communication and the sort of language that I use, I don't use this naturally, I wasn't born like this. I acquired these skills and I learned these skills. But it is my belief that we can fast track the process of people acquiring these skills if what we do is that we decide that we're going to train people. The other issue is that if you hear me talking about selling skills and you hear me talking about me going into a shop and someone cross-selling or upselling to me or asking me, here we haven't talked about Christmas. I was saying to Brenda, I think it was yourself, I was saying to about my father would talk to people around about October and he'd say, Brenda, I need to talk to you about Christmas, not this week, but. But what he's doing is he's planting it in your head and he's saying, I'll be, I'll be getting your Christmas order, so don't be going away. <coughs> so all he's saying is, Brenda, not this week though. And I said to my dad, why didn't you ask him straight? And he'd say, I knew by the look of him, he's not ready. Did you ever get that? I knew by the look of him, he's not ready for me. But I've got him, because he's not going to go anywhere else. But then he would bring it up again. So that issue of, has, have staff got skills? Do they have pride in their appearance? I worked in Guinness, and in Guinness we were trained up hands, hair, feet, and face, which sounds slightly strange, but it's true. In psychology, there's a thing called the primacy recency effect, which basically means you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. And I think it's terribly important. But again, do we give people the training to provide people with the skills to do this? The group you saw smiling in James Doherty's 1961, I should also point out, that was a Sunday, and they were just about to head off on their annual bus run. 
which normally ended in tears in Letterkenny. But the level of motivation there, I would say, is extremely high. So what's the level of motivation? Because it determines when we retain good people. And a big thing in a lot of sectors is people say, I bring people on and I'm training them up. Keeping them is a challenge. It is for sure. But again, what measures are we putting in place to make sure that we retain our staff? What measures are we putting in place to make sure we optimize productivity, such as opening hours and how we do our rota? And how effective the staff are when they're there? Then the other thing is just the drive of staff. The drive of people to do a good job. I still have that to this day. I can't leave work. This is, I, I, I work in another business. And I can't leave work until I've tidied up the kitchen. Because I can't look at a draining board with anything on it. And I know where I got that. So that drive and motivation to say things have to be done a certain way because there's a process. Some of you might say, Michael, you've got a different set of problems, some. But that's okay. <coughs> and then there's the customer. It's interesting that in the service profit chain, then we have the customer. But the first two relate largely to us as a team and how we operate internally. What's the first impression that a customer gets? What kind of feeling does a customer get? I was in my butcher's the other week and someone came in after me and I'm standing at the counter and because of the way I was raised, Jackie the butcher said to me, morning Michael, and I said, morning Jackie, what can I get you? And I said, Jackie, I think this woman's next. And he says, no, no, you were here first. And I said, no, no, please, after you. And she says, no need to be so polite. And I said, well, it wouldn't matter to me. It's just after you, please. I'm in no hurry. And Jackie then served. And he said, okay. And he said, he's awful polite, isn't he? And then Jackie said, he's only showing off. Because that's, he's earned the right for us to have that kind of conversation. It creates a superb feeling in my mind. It also creates a great feeling in the mind of that new customer. Because afterward, I said to Jackie, because I'm nosy, do you know that woman? They said, no, that's the first time you've been in. Bet you it's not the last one. Bet you it's not the last one. And here's another thing I want to ask about the word comfortable. Can I ask you a question, folks? Is everybody comfortable going into, say, an electronic shop? Does anybody here feel uncomfortable going into a phone shop? Put your hands up if you feel uncomfortable going into a phone shop. No? I'm the only one. You're all dead on. You do it. Anybody else do? You know when you go in you get that slight, I oh, hope I don't. hope I know what I'm asking. Does everyone who goes into a retail craft butcher's outlet anywhere in the world, are they completely comfortable <coughs> about what they're there to do? What do you think? No. no? Why do you think not, folks? What are the reasons? What are they worried about? Or uncomfortable about? <coughs> what do you think? I'm worried about like asking a stupid question, like about something. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, we'll say that. Uneducated about meat. Uneducated about meat. Yeah. Anything else? The bill. Once the uh, on the serve or on the serveable counter, and then the, 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 the get a piece of meat that's too expensive. Right. Yeah. And they're worried about overspending. We used to get people coming into the shop and they say, give me a pound of mince and money. Did you get that? Give me a pound of mince and money. They I mean, give me one pound of sterling. And they'd be using that to feed whatever. And that's fine. You have to respect that. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. It was only what? 50 pence a pound then. Sorry? It was only 50 pence a pound. No, no. We're not going back that far. What other things do you think make people uncomfortable? When we think about them coming into our retail <coughs> Butchery space. I find it with like staff or chatting like and they're, they're sort of like going, yeah, you that you come in and don't say hello to you or nothing, they don't acknowledge that you're there. I like, feel fears are comfortable that way. Like. Well maybe to be fair to those people, maybe Adrian they haven't been educated in how to how to meet and greet, how to say hello. I mean some of you have experienced me coming up to you and saying hello. Fran, are you there? Fran, we met earlier there, yeah? But I went up and I think Fran I said, I'm just saying hello to anybody I don't know. How you doing? And Fran, you were very friendly, and you told me with great pride about the shops and Port Leash and whatever. And we had the chat going. I was more good at doing that, Fran. I had to be coached how to do it. I'm fairly good at it now because it need to be after 40 years of doing it, wouldn't it? So is that a skill I was born with or a skill that I learned? It's a learned skill. So what I always say is I go back to the first point. Are the staff 
All staff who work with us capable and comfortable and coached and educated in the arts of persuasion and communication and do they know how to do it? Have we trained them? And if we haven't trained them, we have to carry some of the responsibility if a customer feels uncomfortable about how they're greeted. It's not the customer's fault. And I, again, I always look at everything from the customer's point of view. Does anybody think that's unfair, Megan? I think it's realistic. I think it's realistic. So a big challenge, I think, is to introduce comfort. And when my friend Alan said, I'm looking at Gammon, and I think I want it the way you do it, with the rind and the thing, and I said, talk to Jackie at Murphy's, he'll fill you in and he'll show you how to do it. And he goes, I'm nervous. And I said, don't be. Jackie will walk you through it. While talking to uh, Michael about my meat, I said to him, uh, Maybe judge the leanness for yourself, and I'll pass that along. He said to me, what do you do with that? I said, what? He said, well, your chilli beef. I said, oh, wedges. <coughs> he says, wedges? Are you making wedges then? And I said, ah, and he did this. He lifted it from below, and he went like that, and put it in the bag. What's he doing? It's goose fat. We've had the goose fat conversation with him loads of time. He went like that. Now, when he does that, what he's signifying is, that's a gift from me. And he put it in the bag. What's he doing? He's rewarding my loyalty to him in a very informal way, but a very affectionate way. He's going, Michael, and it goes into the bag. And I said, don't be doing, make sure, and I said to him, there's a pant of mangoes on then. I'd say, make sure you charge me for that, because I wouldn't want to be beholden to you. And he goes, <coughs> take this, it's only an outbid, it goes fat. Fantastic. And it's done in a very informal way, but it's done with a lot of affection, which is great. I went to this thing the other night and this fellow McIntyre was saying about we should all be more affectionate. Maybe we should. Maybe we should. We have to ask ourselves, how do we meet and greet our customers? How do we quiz them about the requirements? How do we ask them about what it is that they need? How do we ask them about their day or their life or how they're getting on? How do we do it? to explore what their needs and wants are by a very <coughs> subtle exploring of my needs and wants. My order went from that <coughs> to everything you see before you tonight. From probably 3 euros to 25, 30 euros. And again, I feel I got exceptional value. Quality is excellent, the service is excellent, and there was no talk of the price. No talk price. Now can I just ask folks, is what I'm just describing exceptional? Is it? What do you think? It's standard. Standard. Yeah. What should be? What should be? But it's also exceptional. And I think that's the thing, that's the challenge. Going back and linking to John's point. I think being standard is, is great and that's good, but being exceptional is what's required, is, is the message that I would send out. But you know what? The easiest thing in the world I've just realized is to stand here and give advice. The hardest thing in the world is to turn up every day and to be doing this stuff. It's hard and I do appreciate it. And the final one you've heard me talking about, folks, is this issue of um, customer loyalty. Um, a long-term retained customer is worth a lot of money. A lot of money. And I think we have to do everything to make sure that we retain them. And for me, the communication and the service side of what we offer is critically important. All those other things are terribly important as well. Look at me, but you can see how they're all linked. They all form part of a service chain that, in my opinion, lead to better profits. There is a huge amount of pressure out there on price, for sure. There's no doubt about that. And there's a lot of people doing stuff, and people are scratching their head going, those prices are incredible when you take into factor the service, when you take into fact the quality of the product. So from that point of view, our challenge is to be differentiated. Our challenge is to be sufficiently different. 
and service and communication is one of the great areas where I think we can do a lot. Because what it does is it retains customers, it makes them come back on a regular basis, and it generates a lot of referral. It's also the most cost efficient way to market a product. And marketing, you hear all the fancy definitions of marketing. When someone asks me, what's your definition of marketing? I say, marketing is the process of cost efficiently choosing who to do business with. So you might say, I'd like to do business with people like Michael McIntyre or people who are like Michael McIntyre, who are probably his friends and peers and associates. And if I thought he could prefer a couple of them my way, sure wouldn't that be great? But what am I doing about making sure that that happens? Can I ask a question, folks? Does that make any sense? But the easy thing is, I realize it's really easy to talk about, but very hard to execute. That's the, in my experience, that's the big channel, and that's what I spend a significant part of my life doing. But the good news is, I, I, I see it every day, and I see people using this kind of language, and I use the thing, some poetry, because I have a real interest in customer service, and I have a real interest in both good, bad, and indifferent customer service, because as a psychologist, I love to watch people, and I realize as well, where I got an interest in psychology was working for my father. Because you see all types of, you see the whole of the world passes before your eyes. And it's just fascinating, because I've never found anything more interesting than people. They're the most fascinating thing I know. And the beautiful thing is that when you listen to the language that people use, and I've heard this, and some of these quotes are ones that I've lifted directly from things I've heard in retail craft butcher outlets that I've visited, or ones that I'm familiar with, or things that I might have heard my uncles and my father saying. It's the kind of language that I hear. That I love the sound of it. People would say, um, give me 10 pound in, or 10 euros in money for that. They go, well, there's 12 in that, which that's perfect, because it's what you want. And people go, well, that's okay. Or I can take some of it out. There's a subtlety in that language. And again, can you coach people that language? Yes, I believe you can. That's your sausages. Now, what are we thinking for Sunday? Do you know how many thought of Sunday yet? Well, think about it now. What we, you normally get a, or you would get a, can I get you, or what about the, have a think about it and come back to me. Do you want me to keep you? Yeah, sure, I'll do that. But sure, you don't have to buy. I heard someone saying this. They were promoting the pork and the sausage, the famous pork and the sausage. And this is the kind of thing you have to earn the right to use, because there's a bit of banter. And there's a bit of wisecrackery in it, but there's beautiful language in it. And the, the person said, you should try a pound of the pork and leaf, but if you don't like them, don't buy them again. And you have to earn the right to say that, because that's a bit cheeky. But what they said was, I'm only joking, look, I'm putting some in for you to try. And they put two. And they said, try them and tell me what you think next week. Selling variety, switch selling, possibly somebody at home will say, oh, I really like those. Again. Where do people learn these skills? And can you fast track the process of acquiring these skills? I believe you can. None of us in this room are frightened of a gamut. Nobody in here is scared of turkey. But there's a lot of people out there who might be. And the point is, and they call it empathizing, which is just put yourself in the other person's shoe. And you say, sure, when you first think about how to cook, a nine pound or ten pound gammon, it can be a bit of a challenge. Most people still soak it overnight. So therefore, it's the process of saying, don't worry, I'll walk you through it. I'll walk you through it. It's just fantastic when you hear people talking in those terms. And again, I'm sure many of you do, but I've just shared with you that I love it. This is the one I got. Oh, those are leading beef chili cubes. The idea for that slow cook chili nonsense should you make them? Melt them out, lovely. Had them last week, great. Oh, we've them trimmed right down. Good. They're a good size of a cube as well. They're a bit big for me. Well, you can always cut them in half, but that'd be too much for you. Do you want me to get jaggy to cut them in half yet? Do so you want me to come around and eat them for you? Does anybody think in a retail outlet <coughs> and in a retail butchery outlet, there's a certain amount of theatre? What do you think? 
There's a certain amount of acting going on, isn't there? It's fantastic. I love it. And I have to say, that's why. But I'm biased. I'm biased. And people say to me, I hate going in the butchers with you because then you start kicking off. I say, I just love it. It's fantastic. Is it not probably one of the last few places where there is? Yes, I, 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 for sure, Brendan, I would agree with you. I also think that certain drinking establishments, there's still a, a boundary track on tourist approach. Um, my, my, my father would drink in the bar and I'd say, how's the beer? And he said, it's terrible. And the barman would say exactly the same thing he's been saying for 30 years. Well, in the 30 years you've been coming for it, do you drink enough of it? So that it all kicks off. But there is a certain amount of theatre, but that amount of theatre People say to me, can you coach people to be good at that? Yes, you can. Can you coach people to have a service commitment? Yes, you can. Can you coach people to have a very strong process-driven approach? Yes, you can. But the key thing is people have to be allowed to be themselves. Why are we changing things? As if things weren't bad enough, there you go changing things. But we have to say there's a strategy here. We're putting service at the center of our business. We're putting our internal staff service at the centre of our business, their development, their skills, the provision of service to customers. We're going to differentiate our business from most of the competition that we have. We're going to be truly, truly exceptional. That's the bit when it can get messy, when you're actually starting to change. Because the hardest thing in the world to change, in my experience, is people's behaviour. It is possible. Very difficult to change people's personality, and slightly different. But it is possible to change people's behaviour, but it takes time and it takes effort and it takes consistency. But ultimately, I, I think it can be very generous at the end if the change is part of the strategy. And I think John has said a lot tonight about how we need to change the way we think about retail. And I, I certainly do believe that. So, as we just round it up in the last five minutes or so, folks, and I'm sure you'll be relieved to hear there'll be a, there'll be a break. Um, I often say to clients when I'm working with them, I say, so what are we going to change? Just make a list, just in no particular order, can we just make a list of what we're going to change? And they go, well, I'm not really sure now what we're doing well and what we're not doing well. I say, well, okay, well, let's, let, let's have a look at it. And what I quite often do is I say to people, well, look, put it like this. What things do you think we're doing well? And apologies, folks, but we've been giving you a sheet there. Uh, it's a simple tool that I would quite often use with clients. And if we could just take two minutes and run through it, I'd often say, look, there's about four or five questions I need to ask you. What are we like at staff training, motivation, and development? How do we do? Are we good? And again, with apologies, folks, if any of you need a hard copy, or sorry, a soft copy, I've sent the PDF to John. I'm sure he'd be happy to fire it onward to any of you that need it. And just ask yourself, how am I scoring myself out of 10? And someone asked me the other week when I was doing something very similar to this in a retail outlet, Michael, should I be scoring myself? And I said, absolutely not. You should probably get your biggest critic who is able to be objective to score your business because they are a true friend. Do you ever get that thing when you go in a restaurant and people say, how's your meal? Lovely, yeah? You go, everything's fine. You may have had the worst meal you ever had, but most people will go, yeah, fine, thank you. Because... They don't feel strong enough to give honest feedback. So what I would encourage people to do when they do this is to say, audit, checklist. Just go through your business and say, what is our recruitment practices? How do we train and induce staff? How much tactical help do we give them? I have to confess, as a, 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 as a younger man, I would have been unsure technically when working in the shop. And I would have been concerned about making mistakes. And therefore, I think, have we trained people to have the tactical skills? But more importantly, have we trained them in product knowledge? Have we trained them in incentives? Have we given them serving skills? Just their standard serving skills and what to do. How would I score myself out of 10? And many of you folks may score yourselves very well. That's great. Invite someone else to score your business. Someone who's prepared to give an independent critical assessment of how you do. And that's the starting point. And then score yourself out of 50. For each one of these, one, two, three, four, five, score yourself to 10 across those issues to say, how do we do? And what does someone think? Including someone who said, look, I'm going to be honest with you. And then what I do is say, well, what do we need to do? What's the required action? Because 
if you're going to eat an elephant, take it about at a time, and I'd say, well, what things should we do? What's the 20 odd things you think would make a difference? Do we need a refit? Do we need new cabinets? Do we need uh, a contract laundry service? Do we need to look at our product range? Do we need to look at how we're going to sell off season and not relying too much on the month of December? Is there something we can do to generate more business in summer season? Are we promoting the entire catchment area? Are we promoting outside the catchment area? Do we need to have social media? Do we need a website or not? What do we do to make people feel comfortable? Do we actively attract people to come in to our outlet to get educated? Do people know that we're a center of education where they can come and very comfortably say, no, I know nothing about gammon and less about turkey. Help me out. If they get helped out, there's a very good chance you are generating loyalty there. So what I do is I say to people, what's the required action? Is there money in it? Because it's very easy for Michael to sit here chatting away. These things cost money. Training costs money. When do I hope to do it? There's, I, I often do scheduling. I'm a bit of a, a Gantt chart man. I like, I, like, I like timelines. And as John Hickey will testify, I'm a bit I'm overcompensated a wee bit on that. I like to low on the details. I like a date. And there's a day I call the 32nd of Julember. You know it well. And I often say to people, if only there's a month called Julember, where everybody leave me alone, you've no idea the stuff I get done. So I say, try and be realistic about how long you think this is going to take. And then pin that somewhere and say, how are we getting on with that? Are we getting through this? Are we getting the stuff done? And it's astounding, but it's hard. And it's really easy for a guy like me to stand here tonight in front of you and say, that's how to do it. People go, I mean, you're not the person that has to execute it. And you're absolutely right, which is why I have a great deal of affinity with businesses, because you've got to get the business, you've got to deliver the business, and then you've got to run the business. Nobody tells you about that. So if that's any use to you, I often say to people, what are the options then? Well, option one. You can do nothing differently. And it's funny, people think the safe thing to do is nothing. I disagree. In the current retail environment, I think to do nothing is extremely high risk. Extremely high risk. Second option is to complete the survey, develop an action plan, and then do nothing. But that's even worse. It should be better to go to the pub or have a night out yourself. Because then you haven't necessarily wasted the time. And then you won't be frustrated thinking, I know all the things I need to do, but I can't get at them. And the third one is to start implementing a service profit action plan. One thing a quarter, one thing every 12 weeks, one thing every six months, one thing a year. So in five years' time, we'll have made a dozen or so changes. That's the sort of piece I'm talking about. It could be your product plan. It could be your promotional plan, it could be your staff development <coughs> plan, who knows. There's some useful reading material, which I'm always reluctant to let people see, but these are two articles with John Hickey was kind enough to drag me to them, and it's been a while since I've read the first one. And I would refer them to him. If you get a quiet bit of time, just you, you're some crack miggle. If you get a quiet bit of time, I think they would merit reading. And this document here, I think is worthwhile doing as an exercise internally. For me, that is the holy grail. For me, a customer's experience is so exceptional. They come back again and again. And they tell other people who come back again and again. And I think that's terribly important. So, as I say, uh, I have a great deal of affinity and pride to have been involved in the sector. I, I, I feel very, very strongly, and I was delighted when John sought me out and said, I hear about your background, could you come and speak to some colleagues of mine? And I'm delighted too. Um, I just want to thank you for your time because I know how tough it is. And I work with a lot of clients through there, and I think that from my perspective, which is always to look at it from the customer's point of view, that's what I would commend to you. So thank you very much for listening. If there's any questions, anybody wants to have a chat, 
um, I'm milling about. So, John, I'll hand over to you, and thank you very much, folks, for listening. Thank you.